temperance. Okay, yes, we had those four. And then on them are hinged other virtues. That's why they're called the cardinal virtues. Because these are the four main ones, fortitude, temperance, prudence, and justice. And then all these others are hinged on them. These are the human ones, okay? Now I'm just going to kind of ask you a question because we had the four. Tell me which one do you remember dealt with wisdom? Which one was human wisdom? Of, the, of prudence, fortitude, justice, or temperance? Which one dealt with wisdom? Prudence. Prudence. Got your hand up there, good girl. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's one for you. Okay. Uh, which one, which of those virtues hinged courage? Which one hinged courage? Yes. Fortitude. <laughs> okay. Um, which one asked us to treat people equally? Equally. Not to discriminate against the poor, the rich, ethnic groups, or whatever. Which one asked us to treat people equally? Justice. Yes. Okay, good. Um, which one dealt with the um, <coughs> sins of the flesh? Which one dealt with sins of the flesh? What is it? Temperance, right, temperance. Prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. Which one hinges reason? One of them hinges reason. Prudence. Prudence. You must have studied Okay, which one hinges chastity? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Temperance. What, what, yes, temperance. There you go. Thank you. Okay, a true or false? Um, we acquire cardinal virtues at birth. We acquire cardinal virtues at birth. True or false? When you're born, you have fortitude, you have prudence, you have justice, you false. have temperance. True or false? False. Right, false. <coughs> okay, true or false? A virtue is a good habit, and that's all. A virtue is a good habit, and that's all. A virtue is a good habit. A little bit more to it than that, are you saying? Does anyone know? A little bit more than that? A virtue is a habitual decision, uh, a firm intent to do good because of your Christian background. So that's what the definition for a, for a um, virtue was. Okay, fill in the blanks. Moral laws come from who? Moral laws come from God. Yes. Good. The word yoke means to Jewish people were yoked. Jesus said, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. What does yoke mean? Burden? No. How about to submit? <coughs> to, to submit. To yoke means to submit. The Jewish people had so many laws that they believed they were yoked to. And Jesus said, I don't have all those laws, you know. My yoke is easy. You know, we talked about the yoke that the animals have and then they're fitted and all that. And he is saying, you know, my burden is light. Uh, you won't have this heavy yoke to carry around. I don't have thousands of, of rules that you have to follow. Um, Another fill in the blank. Little stories told by Jesus to illustrate a moral truth are called what? The little stories that he uses to illustrate a moral truth. Parables. Parables. Thank you, Mr. T. Uh, <laughs> I've slaked on this lesson all week, and my husband finally came to see what is this that she's been slaving on all week. <laughs> That's correct. Okay, parables. Okay, um, you had an assignment to do. This little paper of knowing the virtues, did anyone do it? 
I'm just going to go over, I'll just go down over them. Um, do I give you one minute? No. Just, put, just put the answer in and go back. I'm not going to read them and do all that. I'm just going to give you the answers. Okay. The first one is the letter is C. It could be E. Okay. I had trouble with that. I had yes. 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 So that's a C or an E. The second one, again, is E, but it could be C. Charity, the letter was G. Prudence, the letter was D. Justice, the letter was F. Fortitude, the letter was A. And Temperance, the letter was B. So, let me just go back and reread those if you didn't and, uh, understand these. Now, does anyone have anything specific in the Virtues Notes? that you really, really didn't get and you to were totally lost on it. Um, like we went over the facts that they so hard on, or fast on the news. Okay, let's see, that's the faith one. That's Is that the one you were talking about? How about virtues? Look at your virtues one. The characteristics of virtues, human virtues, They're not infused. They're gotten by human effort. They don't depend on the sacramental graces, but they benefit from them. That's your handout on virtues. Do, do, do you have a virtues outline? Because you'll be able to get your... Okay. Anyone have any questions on that? That was really dealing with the cardinal virtues. Okay, and then we went and talked about um, the theological virtues. And what does the word theo mean? It means that theo God. God. Yes, mm -hmm. logical. Study. Study, study of God. So in the theological, we talked about faith, we could finish faith. And we're ready to move on to uh, hope. Any questions on the faith part?
about the Catholic faith, and we named uh, in the incarnation. The second page was the incarnation. Examples of supernatural truths: the Virgin Birth, transubstantiation in the Eucharist. Is there anything on those two that, that you need reviewed on? We talked about the deposit of faith as the content and entirely of revelation given to the church as God's word as given to his apostles. Plus the traditions. The Catholic Church is based on the written and the spoken. The written is the Bible. The Bible is a Catholic book. Nobody else does. But it is a Catholic book. Everybody uses it, and that's good because they're all Christians. <coughs> but the Bible is a Catholic book. But we also have traditions in the Catholic Church, things that were not written down. You all have traditions for your holidays. Well, the Catholic Church has traditions. Those are the things that were talked about. And, it, and just by word of mouth, every year, those traditions, those dogmas, and all those things about the Catholic Church were kept alive. Then we said that content and faith equals the, Catholic, the Christian life. Now, uh, most of these answers were in the stuff you read. We get through faith. We get faith through trials and sufferings. Because in trials and sufferings, sometimes we realize <coughs> man doesn't have the answers. If you don't have the answers, the only person you can turn to is God. Then we also said that the trials and suffering can cause one to lose faith. And doubt causes us to question, and that doubt comes from the devil. Worry is the work of the devil. He wants you to worry. He wants you to fall away from relying on God. He wants you to blame everyone else for the problems, and that's his rule now. And then we talked about why we use faith and how we get them back. And we ended with the last line, faith is the basis for hope and the foundation of love, of charity. <clears throat> so we will move on now to that.
We believe that there's somewhere that we will go to heaven if we follow God's way. That's what God wants us to do. You know we're not going to last forever. Our bodies are going to wear out. Okay? And we want to know that we're going to a, to a, a happy place. Uh, and that happiness is going to be with God. So the virtue of hope is alive when we believe in what God has told us. He's made promises to us. And we want to believe those. It's your faith that allows you to believe those. See, there's a pattern here. We did faith, now we're hope, and then we'll go to love. So, your faith wants you to believe the things that God has revealed to us through the Bible and through tradition. We want the kingdom of heaven, and we recognize we can't get it on our own. We are sinners, we need God's mercy, and we need God's forgiveness. Fortunately, Catholics have the the blessing of having the sacrament of penance, where we can go to confession and hear that our sins are forgiven. That in turn gives us hope. You know, if you've ever done something that's really bad, that's really weighing on your conscience, okay, we have the ability to go to confession, to confess that, and the priest who is acting in the name of God gives us absolution, forgives us of that sin in God's name. Once once it is forgiven, it is forgotten, okay? And that's, that might be sometimes is a problem people have with confession is, and something that they've done wrong is, they can't let go of it. They can't, their faith isn't strong enough for them to believe that Jesus has forgiven me. He has given me mercy. I don't have to worry about this anymore. So when you go to confession and confess and you get absolution, then the expectation of hope and future life in heaven comes back. Okay, why do we want to hope? Well, I guess it's better to say why don't we want to hope? I mean, we want to hope because we want to know that there's some place to go after this world. Okay, God made us because he loves us. He made us because He is love, and He made us in love, and He wants us to be happy. So He's giving us the desire. You get the desire in baptism. When you're baptized, that desire is in you, but it won't grow unless you are faithful, a faithful believer. So, Romans 12, 12. We got our Bibles back. Would anyone like to find out? And someone else can look for Hebrews 10 through 23. So a Romans 12, 12 is one. And someone else can look for Hebrews 10, 23. That will be coming up. Faith. Okay, so we have faith. 
And now faith is going to help us with the virtue of hope. Hope keeps man from discouragement and the difficulties of today. Sustains us sometimes when we feel abandoned. Sometimes we feel abandoned because we know we've done bad things. Okay, and we think, oh my, even God's abandoning us. Not so. Not so. He's very merciful. When we go to confession, an absolution is given. We have hope because the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation has been given to us. Hope opens man's heart to believe that we can go to heaven and that our purpose is to go to heaven. Not even even when you have bad things happening in your life. I think sometimes Christians say, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have my faith. What you're saying is, hope is keeping me alive. Hope is getting me through this by faith and hope. Because of the expectation for happiness in heaven. Man is preserved from selfishness when he professes hope. And thank goodness it's the Holy Spirit who gives us this help and the grace to get us through. So, in uh, Proverbs 3, 5, is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight. We cannot be saved on our own. It isn't possible. We need God. Death is inevitable. People try to ignore it, but it's inescapable. It's going to happen. Purgatory, another belief that we have, gives us hope. It takes away the fear of death because it shows how much God wants us to be with Him. Because we believe that no one dies without some kind of sin or stain on their soul. And so we believe that it's not a, a matter of hell or heaven. It's a matter of purgatory. I guess you said hell, purgatory or heaven. Um, you know, we believe that we would go to purgatory to have complete cleansing. And then St. Michael the Archangel escorts us into heaven. This is why we say when our loved ones die, pray for their souls. You need to be praying for the people who are in purgatory. Because many of them don't know that, they are, that their relatives are praying for them. Maybe, maybe they don't have anyone praying for them. So I had a, someone who was in purgatory, and I prayed and prayed for that person. And it was at a time in my life when this person committed suicide, and the church believed the suicide was so wrong. And so, um, you know, it's, is this person in hell, or is this person in purgatory, or is this person? And so I was advised to pray, continue praying. And if that person is then moved into heaven, your prayers will go to someone else in purgatory. So we believe very much in the praying for the souls in purgatory. In scripture, we have examples of how God took care of his people. We know that um, Abraham, okay, Abraham by faith decided to leave his homeland and go to where God told him. And then there was Isaac, okay, and Isaac was uh, purified by the test of sacrifice. In Romans 4, in scripture, it says, Hoping against hope, he believed and thus became the father of many nations. Abraham believed in the Lord. And I think we ended our class last week by looking at uh, the faith uh, a couple pages in Scripture. I mean, goodness, it was just so many. Is it Hebrews? Exodus? Or was that? Just two pages of everyone who believed in faith this happened, in faith that happened. So, faith believing. Abraham believed. Now, <coughs> we have. Coming up next, the study of the Beatitudes, because the Beatitudes are blessings, or the Beatitudes are happy, happiness. So they fit well in with, with hope, because um, we want to be happy. And the Beatitudes, Beatitudes are, in the New Testament, what the Ten Commandments were in the Old Testament. Um, Moses gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments uh, that God had written down. 
sacrament. We said that last week. The only thing God ever wrote down, on one finger, he wrote down the sacraments. He had three on one stone and seven on the other. And um, when Moses went down, and the people then had changed their mind and decided to worship the golden calf, Moses was so upset with them, he smashed them, and then he had to go and write them again. But uh, in the Old Testament, Moses gave God's moral law to the Israelites because three months after they were out of Egypt, they were wandering through the desert, and they were they had no laws. They had nothing to guide them. And, you know, they were they were loose from the Egyptian law, and so they were. And God said, "I need to give them laws." And so that is when God decided He took Moses up in a cloud, and um, He and Moses worked on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> And when Moses came down and found out the people were worshiping the calf, and he was mad and smashed him and then made new ones. But the Ten Commandments were the directions on natural law, on how God wanted his people to live in order to go back to him. That's the Ten Commandments. Very important. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus gives us his interpretation to the Ten Commandments. And Jesus gives us the Sermon on the Mount. And this is more like, um, the Beatitudes are more like um, character traits, attitude changes. I mean, this is the way you should think if you want to get to heaven. These are the things you should do, not just as an individual, but for communities, okay? And we use the word blessed, but it can also be said to be happy. So blessed is a better translation because they're about the happiness that we want as we move towards the kingdom. Riches, fame, and nothing, no other human achievements will give us the happiness that we're going to get from God. So to follow the Beatitudes is, is a good thing to follow. And so the Beatitudes are, we're just going to go over those. Blessed are the poor in spirit. <clears throat> what that means is, blessed are people who are humble. Okay? They realize that they have a spiritual poverty. They realize they are not in touch with God. And they know they need God's mercy and they need God's love. And scripture says, this is the person who learns to live without material possessions. Because when you don't have the material possessions, you're going to rely on God. I mentioned last week about the missionaries to go to third world countries and people live in tracks and shanties on uh, shanties and dirt floor and no running water and brick water and all that kind of stuff. But they love their God, but they have nothing else. So let's know the poor in spirit. Catechism number 2547 says, The Lord gives over the rich because they find consolation in the abundance of goods. Let the proud seek and love earthly kingdoms. That's not good. But blessed the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a quote of St. Augustine. We want to be careful that we don't make the material things the things that we want. And all of that happens as we mature in our spiritual life. You know, we, all, we start as babies in our mature, in our spiritual life and we grow in that. And it's like, you know, I sometimes think I'm going to offend people, uh, young people who are just starting out and they want a car and they want a boat and they want this and they want all that and they want this before they have kids and uh, they want to do all that. And God is saying, that's kind of not the way it should be. Yes, you, you want things. He wants us to have things. He gave us material things. Okay. So, he wants us to have them, but he doesn't want them to take the place of him. So let's leave it at that. The second blessed is, blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are they who mourn. And that is, blessed are the people who recognize their weaknesses. And recognize their brokenness. And recognize that they don't have all the answers. And they can't all do it on their own, or do it all on their own. And so, they need God. Again, it's a, 
it's an attitude thing where we're not allowing the, wor the worldly stuff to get in the way of uh, our faith with God. The third one was, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that means people should know how to um, control their strength. It's a it's a matter of control, controlling your, your strength. And I don't know how else to explain it. Um, to be meek is to have your strength control. The next one is blessed are the righteous. Those standing in right, those in right standing with God, those who show moral conduct according to God's will, that are people who are morally right. I mean, they try, they're trying to be good. They're trying to be good. And that's all God wants. We're not all going to be perfect, but He wants us to try. And that comes from knowing our faith, and knowing the Ten Commandments, and knowing the precepts of the church. The next one is, Blessed are the merciful. And God asks us to be merciful. You recall in Scripture there was the servant who owed Jesus money and he owed him money and he said, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you right now. And Jesus said, that's okay. So that servant then goes out and someone comes up to him and says, I'm sorry, I don't have the money to pay you. And he and that guy beat up on him. And when Jesus heard about that, he said, how could you do that? I showed you mercy. Why are you not showing me mercy? Somebody tapped that man in the back. I told him he was not allowed to do that. Kick him. Tom, wake up. Tom, oh, jeez. Wake up. Please. You're not sleeping in my class. Honey, he heard you. You need to get up and walk around. He heard this before. That's why. What's that? He heard this before. He heard this before. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's um, being pure, okay? To be in the temple, one need to be clean of heart. So, you know, it's, it's purity, it's chastity, it's um, being pure. Pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Okay? And that's perfect instruments of God extending God's peace to others because we are all of the above. We have to be instruments of peace. And the last one is, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We will receive rewards in heaven if we follow God's way. And it is the opposite. If we're only seeking the rewards of this world, you're not going to get the ones of the other world. You know, if it's fame and materialism and status and all that kind of stuff that you're looking for, that's not what God wants in us. So blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They receive rewards in heaven if they follow God's way. That is the opposite of external rewards. Matthew 5.12. Could someone find Matthew 5.12?
It could. We have four different Bibles here, so. <laughs> Is it rejoice and be glad? Uh huh. Um, greater reward will be great in heaven. Right. I'll stay persecuted the prophets Okay. So that's 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 it. Be glad and be happy because a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how men perceive the prophets who lived before you. Remember, remember, God had the prophets come before Jesus. God tried everything to get his people together. You know, I mean, Adam and Eve sinned. He didn't say, well, that's it. To hell with you. Um, I'm done with you. He said, woman, you're going to suffer in child labor. Man, you're going to have to toil. And that's the way it's going to be. That, that was mercy. He was being merciful. Okay? He made the snake crawl on the ground and all that. But but then we had all those years when, because now God was not visible. Remember when Adam and Eve in the garden, God was visible. Once that happened, he was gone. God is not visible to sin. Okay? That's why when we sin, we go to confession. Because his back is to us. Okay? So it's important to go to confession and confess the sin so that you're back in the graces of God again. And that's the word repent, all through scripture. It's repent. Repent and come back to me is what he's saying. Repentance is very, very important. So then, but nobody did. Nobody did that. So what did God say? I've had it with you people. I'm going to drown you all. So he flooded the earth except for Noah and his family and the animals, and he flooded the earth. He wiped them out because they were not following him. So then we have the series of things happening after Noah, that uh, everything started again, and uh, let's see, we had all those generations, and still people were not following him. And so finally, um, he had the prophets come to try to talk to them, to say, this is what's going to happen. Um, he had the judges come. He had the people then, they said, I want a king. They want a king. And they still weren't following God. So finally, God said, uh, I guess what I have to do is I have to come down there and I have to let you know who's in charge. And that's when he sent his son in his image to walk the earth, to heal people, to cure people, to spread the word that I am God and I am in control and this is what I want you to do. So, the virtue of hope has two sins. There's two sins against um, hope that people have. The first one is despair. Some people feel so burdened down by sin, that they want to give up. They, they give up hope for happiness with God. They don't trust God. Uh, they don't believe that he, His love is for us and that there's goodness and justice and mercy. Mainly because they don't understand the nature of God. Okay? They don't understand the incarnation. They don't understand that He sent Jesus to die for us on the cross so that death would be conquered and we could now get into heaven. Those concepts are not sometimes in the mind of people who are suffering from despair. But it's up to us as believers to witness to them. You know, we have to show them. The Holy Spirit through us has to, to show them how important it is to come to God, to know His commandments, to know what He tells us and to practice justice and charity. Luke 17, 33 says, whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it. Now that sounds confusing, because then he says, but whoever loses his life will lose it. What he's saying is, whoever seeks to gain his life here on earth and have everything you want here on earth, and the fame, the notoriety, and the money, and the materialism, and all that stuff, that's not going to get you to heaven. But you lose all that on earth, you will preserve your route to heaven. So, the advice is if we're becoming pessimistic about the world or the state of affairs in our society, we need to examine our hope. We need to repent. We need to go back to God, read scripture, prayer, do those kind of things so that we 
uh, get on the right track again. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 8. Does anyone have that? 1 Thessalonians 5 8. blue paper and the idea was one a lot of it with their morality laws so it was Sundays businesses had to be closed like in Boston up until the 1800s the constable would go around and if you weren't in church on Sunday or if you were Jewish and not at the synagogue on Friday night going into Saturday you would be arrested and fined a certain amount of money depending on how many times you had decided to skip religious services. Other ones were women had, it was women would have to wear dress down to <coughs> the ankle or town wouldn't, would be a dry town or a dry county and starting in the 50s and 60s they started taking those off the books and a good, the logic behind them was really a lot of them were written as being the state, was, the state was basically going, if we let these behaviors happen, Christian citizens will be offended. And the line of reasoning was, well, we can't make non-Christian citizens follow laws that were passed to keep Christians from being offended. But it even included you could only buy a certain amount of cigarettes at a time. You, Another one actually was, if you were a man under the age of 25 in most states, you owed the first 50 cents of every dollar to your father. Every dollar you got paid at work, you owed the first 50 cents to your father if you were under 25. Okay. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little irritated if I'm out here working in the fields and my dad, who's already a made man, gets... Now, he could give it back to you, and that's what happened, but the idea was to get you to go out and... It was the... The emphasis behind that one was, well, if you go out and get married, now you don't have to give your dad, your old man, the first 50 cents of every dollar. Okay, that's very complete. I was just going with, you know, the stores had to be closed. Um, but, but then it changed, and it was... Um, the alcohol beverages couldn't be sold, okay? What they found out was, uh, among middle-aged Americans... The repeal of the blue laws had a 5 percentage point to a 10 percentage point effect on weekly attendance at religious services and increased the rate of deaths of despair by two deaths per 100,000 people. 
Now it says, although 77% of church-going Protestant Christians say they observe Sunday as a day of rest, only a small number of them refrain from shopping or attending entertainment events, according to a survey by the Life Research. It said, um, <clears throat> participation in religious services fell. They, the economists were able to map a direct connection between the repeal of laws and the increase of the deaths of despair. When they talk about the deaths of despair, they're talking about um, people who died from drug poisonings, suicide rates, and alcohol liver disease. And they're saying those three things increased a high percentage, 30% here. Then they go on to say that he calls religion a powerful coping behavior that enables people to make sense of suffering, provides control over the overwhelming forces of nature, and promotes social roles, and facilitates communal living, cooperation, and mutual support. So, giving positive advantages to recognizing your faith. Religious beliefs and practices provide guidelines for human behavior that reduce self-destruction and pathological forms of coping, leading to fewer deaths of despair among the religious. So he's talking about people that have a faith, okay? Attending a religious service at least once a week is associated with greater life satisfaction. It's more frequent than volunteering. It gives a higher sense of mission, a greater tendency to forgive others. And it lowers the probabilities of drug use and early sexual activity. So, and they, they've talked to a lot of young people. This is, this one says 6,000. It says frequency of prayer and meditation along with more frequent religious attendance had a protective effect against the three dangers of adolescence, depression, substance abuse, and risky sexual behavior. It said religion is certainly not the only important protective factor, but an important health and well-being resource, and one that to my mind is being neglected, especially in adolescents and young adults, as we referred to today. So it, religion, along with providing social support, hope, purpose, and values, Religion helps adherents develop self-discipline, self-regulation as they seek to follow their faith's guidance and systems. Very timely, very interesting. That's the epic time. I don't know what everybody gets that. One. Okay, um, the second sin of hope, first is despair, the second is presumption, okay? Presumption is a form of pride and it ruins our faith because it presumes two things. Number one, it presumes that we can save ourselves apart from God. Like, we don't need God. Like, I don't need to go to church. I can go out in nature and feel God. Okay? All the things you miss by not being in a religious environment on a Sunday. But the presumption is we save ourselves by our own strength apart from God. And the second is... We believe God will save us anyways because he's such a nice God. He will save us anyways, even though we do not repent and convert. They presume his mercy without repentance. All through scripture, Jesus is saying, repent, repent and come back to me. My arms are spread out. I want to take you in. Come back. So the sin of presumption is very serious. Uh, people have to acknowledge it and recognize it and repent, okay? <coughs> the presumption. Uh, I think we see this in a lot of um, relationships, like experimental marriage relationships, okay? Let's try this and see if it's going to work. Let's live together, okay? Let's do that and see if it's going to work. Again, it's a presumption that it's okay to do it. It isn't. Um, by the virtue of the Ten Commandments. And I don't know how much we talk about sin in our church. I have to ask Father. Lawrence, what do you think? 
Good. We We're talk a lot about sin, because I know in some churches they don't talk about sin at all. We do. I think we have a good, healthy balance, because I grew up with a vegan sinner whose sin was always ever talked about. And Jesus didn't have to come save us from ourselves. And he did, and we all crucified him anyway. I mean, it's a vivid, seared in my memory kind of memory of being nine years old and a depiction of the crucifixion. But instead of the Romans doing it, it's grandparents, parents, and little kids and the pastor pointing, you did this. You nailed Christ to the cross. I don't know about you guys, but I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. <laughs> it wasn't even a thought yet. Right. But I think we have a good happy answer. The thing I, I hear a lot from people who are Catholic, it's my best friend's biggest criticism is about Catholicism is, well, I can do whatever I want. I'll just go to, co to confession. It doesn't, we'll talk about it when we get to the confession lesson, but that in itself makes it not count, right? It's like, Right. We all know right. somebody who thinks that they can talk to you however you however they want, and you'll just do it, or they don't need to make any effort. You'll just keep coming and talking to them. It's the same thing. We can't presume that because we have something that it's that we can just go do it. Like yes, rehab's a thing, but that doesn't mean I should go do heroin right. or alcohol abuse or what have you just because there's rehab. Right. Thank you. Okay, so presumption. Let's let's say let's kind of summarize this. Hope uh, when we have hope, it fosters prayer. The Holy Spirit is behind us, teaching us because we get the Holy Spirit in confirmation. And it's one of our gifts. Uh, confirmation is receiving the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit of baptism, but in confirmation, you say, "I want to be a Catholic." Uh, I want to recognize the, the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, mass, prayers, Bible reading, the Eucharist, all of those things help to nourish us in hope. And again, as I said, we need to be evangelizers. We need to witness hope to those people because that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. We People see us in a joyful mode uh, when we're sharing our faith, when we're comfortable in our faith. They see a peace in us that maybe is not in others who don't, you know, have a strong belief. Uh, the virtue of hope, or one of the fruits of hope is joy. And so joy and the peace of feeling that people see is a characterization of someone who um, knows the church, loves the church, and is following the church. We say that hope is the anchor, the symbol for hope is an anchor, okay? An anchor goes like this. An anchor. Hope anchors the soul. Hope anchors the soul. And the soul is what protects us, okay? The anchor is the traditional Christian symbol for hope. By faith we hope. In hope we love. So those are our three theological virtues. The greatest witness to hope is to practice the third theological virtue, and that's love. Okay, so we're ready to move into the theological virtue of love. Any questions on hope? Did I hit on anything that you wonder about? Can I add one more thing? Yes. Am I allowed to add one more thing? Yes. The other one is hope's not just for ourselves in that I have hope I'm going to get to heaven. We're supposed to have hope that everybody else is going to, which is part of one of the dangers of presumption. We kind of thought we think we can save ourselves or God will save us anyway. It's also, I, it's what I grew up with was in a church I grew up in and said babysitter's church was we're saved everybody else is dirty awful sinners and we're going to get to go to heaven and point down at hell and laugh at them while they're all down there what ins if we have that attitude what incentive do we have for everybody else how are we contributing to other people's hope if we act like we're the only ones with and that's my 
funny, but thank you. We need to be evangelizers. There's no doubt about it. And they do say that, you know, the Catholic Catholics are by nature private. I think we've been kind of made to be private because we have all these people that sometimes don't act like, well, they act like there's something wrong with us. When we came here about 46 years ago, Catholics were still underground. I mean, you just didn't say you were Catholic. Well, I had a lady say to me, no, I would never marry a Catholic. Yeah, that's fine. And now I came from a community where there were, it was full of Catholics. And so this was all new to me, you know. And my husband came from a town where there's uh, the Greek Catholic, the Roman Catholic, the, all, all of them. They're all on different corners, you know. So this was all new. And well, that lady that said that eventually became a, our, our local grandma for my kids. And uh, she got to find out we weren't such bad people. Anyway, but there is that thought. I don't know why. I don't know why some of you who, are, who were never Catholic, why? <laughs> no? I've heard that before a long and here you are. Are you sure you're going to... Are you in a closet on this? Or do people know you're coming to these classes? <laughs> I make it known. I'm not... We were brought up... Dad talked about being Catholic. I mean, we might have gone to the Methodist church, but Dad had talked about being Catholic. Right. Well, he was. He is Catholic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he is. So he went to the Catholic Church and you went to the Catholic Church. We followed, like, her parents, Sherman Thurman. Okay. That was, you know, Catholic. You know, you got to wonder. But then you remarried in the Catholic Church. Yes. Yeah. Were your parents against you marrying a Catholic? Absolutely not. Good. Okay. <laughs> that, that almost <laughs> ripped. you know my mom and dad? <laughs> no, that almost ripped, that almost ripped my, my household apart. Oh, yeah. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. That's and it wasn't, it wasn't because I was marrying. It's because when I became Catholic. Oh, yes, of course. Because uh, I literally was discerning to be a minister until I got married to a Catholic. And then that was all right, but my father was a deacon in the church. And I was next in line, and I gave it up. And so when he passed away, that was the end of our family in the church. And that hit him very hard until he realized that that... Uh, our Eucharist, uh, you know, our services every Sunday were the identical to his. The readings were identical, everything. And we would sit down and discuss it. Uh -huh. And he realized there's not that much difference. And at that point, he was okay with it. But yeah. Your father-in-law said, Oh, I, my, before I was married, um, he had asked my, my husband, Is she Catholic? With a name like Zanino, is she Catholic? Yeah. And told him that he wasn't allowed to marry me, but Greg said he didn't, you know, he was like, it didn't matter, he was, that was not going to be an issue, but uh -huh. um, we never, him and I never sat and talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Tor, Tor. Yeah. And then my former babysitter to this day will not talk to me if we're in the same room at home. Now, if we're out in public, like whenever she when I worked at the Macy's in the Mitney Mall before they closed, she saw me there. It'd be at least social pleasantries. Hi, how are you? Where's I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. Where are they at? That kind of thing. But oh, I mean, I'm sitting here in the chair. The front door's about where the ladies' restroom door. She comes in, sees me sitting there. We make eye contact. I even give a wave, and she looks at my mom. How's Torn doing? I go, I'm doing great. <laughs> Thanks oh, for asking, and she asked my mom, yeah, how's he doing? I'm, she's like, well, he just said he's doing fine. He's, yeah. uh, there's that, my, where I used to live, my neighbor, a boy, uh, was playing with my youngest son, and the boy said, I'm not allowed to play with you because you're bad people. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I think a lot of it's uh, ignorance. They don't. They're afraid because they don't know. Right. I come from Perry County, and if you're Catholic, you're a rich and snobby. And you're Heather's, yeah. Oh, and they, you weren't like for that reason? Yeah. Oh. You're better than everybody else. Well, rich, rich and snobby? Yeah, you're, you're better than everybody else. 
<laughs> well, yeah. They said a church. <laughs> they said a church has all the money, and yeah. We don't. We don't allow <laughs> others. Uh, we don't allow Protestants to receive communion, and then, some of them get angry at that. They were sort of elitist. We don't get angry. We uh, still don't understand yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's coming. Stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay. Let's do the virtue of charity. Uh, well, charity is love. Faith, hope, and love. Okay. And the proclamation for this is from uh, Matthew 13, 14, and it says, Love is the essence of the inner life of the Trinity. It's the soul of holiness and the basis upon which we will be judged. Read that again. Love is the essence of the inner life of the Trinity. It is the soul of holiness and the basis upon which we will be judged in heaven. The faithful will live in the joy of perfect love. So the way to life as God wants us is shown by love. And it is expressed in words and actions towards God and neighbor. So the way to life as God wants it is shown by love, expressed in words and actions towards God and neighbor. Does someone have Luke? 10, 25, 37. 25. Yeah, Dan, when we order new Bibles, let's make them large print. Large print, yes. About this reading. big? The letter's about this big. <laughs> well, we have that in Bible can, study, too. So we can have people out. We have a lady yeah, I talked, the magnifying glass. I talked to jo Jody uh, today, actually, about that. So we'll we'll discuss when it comes time for the fiscal year to increase our budget. But that's on the plans. So she agrees that it probably can't. Is that in June? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because right, right now we only have $50. <laughs> okay. yeah. You're welcome to bring your own Bible, too, folks. What if, do you need to read this in two bits? Luke 10, read a little bit, and as the Spirit moves you, somebody else reads. Can we do that? You want me to start at verse 25? Verse 25? Okay. There was a scholar of the law who stood up and to test him and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? <coughs> he said in reply, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, <laughs> And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road. When he saw him, he passed on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was needed to catch him at the site. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine, then he lifted his wings and bent his toes. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an alley, and prepared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instructions. Take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the Lord's temple? He answered, The one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and be like us. Okay, the story of the Good Samaritan. And so uh, that is a challenge to us that we have to live our life in a holy way um, because of our faith and because of love. Now the Samaritans were, they were 
who are able to forgive that person. I mean, Pope John Paul showed us forgiveness and mercy and love when he went to the person that tried to uh, kill him. You know, he went to the prison and he talked to him and so on. And how about the uh, Amish schoolhouse where the children were murdered? I mean, the Amish people were able to forgive. I mean, they they verbally said, we forgive what has happened here. It's like, love the sinner, but hate the sin, okay? That's kind of what we do with our kids when we want to discipline, you know. I love you, but I don't love what you did. And then we do that with big people, too. So, um, those people follow the virtue of love in an act of forgiveness. So, the Holy Spirit's grace, the Holy Spirit's grace is acting in this situation. It purifies our ability to love. Love strengthens our moral life and is the greatest of the three virtues. And it's actually the greatest gift that God gives us, is love. God made charity the new commandment. This is my commandment that you love one another and I, as I have loved you. We are asked to love, to give up self-centeredness, and we love, love other people, even our enemies. And we simply do this in simple acts of charity, uh, to the poor, to the widows, to the orphans. And I think you have a handout that says, small acts motivated by charity are infinitely greater than any heroic action that lacks charity. The uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love is not, you know, that, go all through that. That's something to read. That's that's a nice verse to read. I have a lot of things on that one. Um, love is the virtue that most characterizes Christian life, and it should be reflected in all of our actions. The fruits of love are joy, peace, and mercy. Joy, peace, and mercy. We have um, fruits of the Spirit. These are the fruits of the Spirit. These are our cardinal virtues. One, two, three, four. These are hinged on them. They're the human. These are the theological. Okay? And you'll note up here when we did this last week, um, if somebody wasn't being um, charitable, they were being greedy. And that was one of the vices. Okay? When we did uh, temperance, if they weren't being chased, then there was lust involved. There's a vice of lust. So we have the seven vices, and um, these are our virtues. But in confirmation, you get all of these gifts, but these are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, generosity, goodness, gentleness, self-control, modesty, faithfulness, chastity, and patience. So when I talk about the joys and the, the fruits of charity, that's where we're coming from. Um, what are the sins against God's love? The greatest sins against God's God's love. That's the people not wanting God's love. Number one is indifference. They're indifferent. They just don't know. They just refuse to reflect on it. Ingratitude. They don't want to acknowledge that God is love and we are to give back to Him in our way. Lukewarmness. They don't respond to God's love. They're negligent in that. They're lukewarm to their faith. Sloth. That is refusing joy that comes from God. That is refusing, that's knowing there's God and saying, well, I really don't care about God. Okay. That's, that's bad. And the last is hatred of God. There are people, that comes from pride. They deny God's love and His goodness and they presume to curse Him who forbids sins. You know, that's pride. You know, um, Pride is right up there. Right there's pride. Okay. I say pride should be on top, but I learned these alphabetically. So that's why P is down here before S. <laughs> a is up there, that's A. Then envy. Okay. But pride is probably one of the greatest reasons for our sin is thinking we know what we're doing, we're in charge. And you know, that's hard if you are a person who God has gifted with leadership abilities and uh, 
he, you all have gifts. But we have to remember that the gifts were given to us, and we are to give them back to him as Christians. We are not to use them as like, oh, now God gave me all these gifts. I'm, I'm, now I'm the king. Okay? No. It's, that's, no. He gave us the gifts. Remember the servants that were given money, and the one buried his. And the other one went and had the two turn, turned into four, and so on. And God scolded the one who buried it. You buried your gifts. I gave you gifts. What, what are you doing with your gifts? So, we have the gifts, and we are to use them. The question is, what is life without love? Even when there's hope, even when there's faith, a failure of love for God and neighbor is a sin. The characteristics of love. It's the greatest of the virtues. It's the highest <coughs> of the will is to love. And when I mentioned people who have hurt other people and deaths that have occurred because of somebody else's negligence, and those people can be forgiven, that is an act of the will, okay? Because they know they're supposed to. Um, Love is not something to do. It is the point of everything we do. And it's our vocation from God. Love inspires us to be self-giving, to want to take care, to do these things. It makes justice possible. Remember the uh, virtue of justice. <coughs> Love is the source of our prayer. And through it, we reach higher prayer. Higher prayer. Let's see. Um, having everything but lacking love means being nothing at all. Having everything but lacking love means being nothing at all. That was Scrooge. Okay? That was Scrooge. He had everything but he lacked love. You know, we have these people down from history and our stories and that stuff. I had this cute little saying, no, it's not cute, but love is an ongoing process to let go of having something my way. Most of us have at least a little stubborn <coughs> streak in us. Scripture says, be subject to one another. It calls us to grow up and give in at least some of the time. <laughs> I think that's good for married couples. I know it's been good for me. <coughs> Okay, Corinthians has all hey, man. those. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if you were right. <laughs> I'm awake. <laughs> now you are. <laughs> um, our quotes from uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, that whole, that whole love is patient, love is kind is, um, the first one is important. If I have not charity, I am nothing. If I have not charity, I gain nothing. And still, one Corinthians. If I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And the last is, so faith, hope, and charity abide. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So we would say the theological virtues of love are they are supernatural you get them in baptism infused by god they're in your soul they're on your soul they allow us to participate in god's life it's the basis for a moral life it is necessary for salvation and it is grown in us by cooperating with the holy spirit I have one little cute little poem here, and this will be our close. It's called Hope Pushes On. This takes in all the three virtues, and it reads, Faith sees what is in time and in eternity. Hope sees what will be in time and for eternity. 
in the future, so to speak, of eternity itself. Charity loves what is, in time and in eternity. God in neighbor, as faith sees God in creation. But hope loves what will be, in time and for eternity. In the future, so to speak, of eternity. Hope sees what has not yet been and will be. She loves what has not yet been and what will be in the future of time and eternity. On the uphill path, sandy and troublesome, on the uphill road, dragged along, hanging from the arms of her two older sisters, that's Ethan, who hold her by the hand, the little hope pushes on. And in between her two older sisters, she seems to let herself be carried, like a child who lacks the energy to walk, and is dragged along the road in spite of herself, but in reality, it is she who moves the other two, and who carries them, and who moves the whole world, and who carries it. So, um, I had some other things to pass out, but pass that up. That's just something on strength and courage to add to our thing from last week. I had some other things, but the, the uh, printer up there was not working, so and I want to give you that's both. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I don't know. It's a whole thing. That's a love. That's a love around. So you should have the little prayers of faith, hope, and love. Kind of, if you do meditation in the day, or tuck it on your bathroom window, or a mirror, or whatever, and when you're brushing your teeth, or what say these little prayers. We did the act of faith to open the class. Um, let's do the act of love to close it. There isn't enough love. <laughs> <laughs> we do have enough love to pass oh, we don't around. have enough love. <laughs> oh, no. We're short one. Okay. No, we're short. Did you give this time? I can give Mr. T one at home. I did get one. Yeah. Where's, Where's the book? I was going to say, make sure Kennedy gets one. Did right. uh, you get both of them? I love you. I gave my love to mom. Okay, I can give it to you next week. Oh, no, this is starting to remind me of the 60s. <laughs> all, this, all this free love going on. Right <laughs> so what do we... Wait, do we wear flowers? We all have faith, hope, and love? No, no, no. I have this open mind. Yeah, yeah. No, faith. No, the, one, well, we the, first, faith. the first one was faith. Oh, oh, oh. We opened with faith. Oh, yeah. okay. That's the one we've done. Here, I'll give you one. You've lost your faith, really? No, it's here. It's here. Lost your faith, isn't it, love? Faith, love. Faith, love. That's hard, love. Everyone has everything. I don't have love. We're passing our love, you tell me. I'm sorry. Here's another love. Oh, okay. It's not laminated, but... They can have mine. It's scored. They can have mine. Love? Anybody else need love? Kennedy, do you have? Yeah. Everyone has? Certainly. Okay, let's close with the act of love. And next week... Um, Father Peter. Father teaches. Peter. Yep. Okay, Father Peter. Mm -hmm. He'll be back in Israel and he will be. He'll be teacher. back this weekend. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh my God, I love you above all things, with my whole heart and soul, because you are all good and worthy of all my love. I love my neighbor as myself for the love of you. I forgive all who have been. And I ask pardon of those who might have injured. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, folks, for hanging in there. Thank you. She doesn't have to believe for you. Okay. So go ahead. She believes in it. We're going to leave you. You need to come more often. <laughs> For but this week, Dan, yes. what are they doing?
doing for this too? For next time? Uh, yeah. do, 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 the oh, here it is. I don't know if I can find my papers. Okay, I've lost my place. There it is. It's your turn. Oh, I can. You It is really sad. Don't forget. Do not Body in the church. Do you know?